Hi, everyone. I think everyone's joining now. Hi, and welcome um, to this Natural Capital Conversation. My name's Megan Meacham, and I am based at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And I'm a postdoc there and also the research coordinator for a collaborative research program between the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University and the Natural Capital Project at Stanford. Um, and I am going to introduce the Natural Capital Project, this conversation series, and what we're going to do today. So the Natural Capital Project, um, or NAPCAP, is a collaborative initiative working to pioneer science, technology, and partnerships that highlight the values of natural capital and environmental services in a broad range of planning and development decisions. And our goal is to enable people and nature to thrive together. And centered at Stanford University, the NATCAP partnership is made up of five additional core members that you see here. And the Natural Capital Conversation series is the newest addition to NATCAP's uh, virtual programming. So it's conversations with scientists, practitioners, and leaders in government and business. And the format is designed to engage uh, the panelists and the audience in discussion, learn from each other's exper experiences, and promote connections and broaden networks. And you can follow the NACCAP project uh, to get notifications for upcoming conversations and also find recordings of previous conversations around other topics. Today, we are gonna focus on when and how will nature provide urban solutions. Um, with this excellent panel of speakers, we have Eric Anderson, who's the Associate Professor and Principal Researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center. We have Joseph Kane, who's a fellow at the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program. We have Todd Gartner, who's the director for City, Cities for Forests and Natural uh, Infrastructure at the World Resources Institute. We have Timon McPherson, who's the associate professor and director of the Urban Systems Lab at the New School. And we have Seema <laughs> Kairam, who's the design lead at Able City. Um, how today will look, we will start now with me giving these opening remarks and then I'll hand over to our co-moderators, Anne Gary, who's the Chief Strategy Officer and Elite Scientist at the Natural Capital Project at Stanford, and Eric Lomsdorf, who's the Program Director and Lead Scientist at the University of Minnesota, also part of the Natural Capital Project. Um, then we'll open and have a discussion around challenges and opportunities and, uh, and a further discussion, including with you, the audience. So uh, one final thing is that uh, we will have a question and answer uh, box available for you. So you can enter your questions and comments for the panelists. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to access that Q&A box. And there you can put your questions and comments and then we'll use the chat for any technical difficulties or other uh, webinar logistics. So with that, I would like to hand over to Anne Gary. Thanks, Megan. Hey, everybody. So glad you're here. Um, so uh, NatCap has been working in urban systems for a few years now. And we're seeing both so many opportunities to bring more nature to cities and all the benefits that it can bring to urban residents of all species. But we're also seeing a lot of different challenges in implementation. And so um, Eric Lonsdorf and Megan and I had a great time dreaming up this session. Um, where we've invited a really fabulous group of panelists ranging from academia to practice and a lot in between to help us explore those challenges and opportunities for including nature-based solutions in cities. So as Megan said, we're going to first start with some a focus on challenges and then we're going to focus on opportunities and then we'll have time for discussion at the end. 
Um, we're aiming for a very interactive session. So we're, we're asking our panelists to start with brief opening remarks in each of those sessions. So you'll hear little chimes if people are going over their three minutes, because um, we wanna make sure that we have time for a lot of interaction through that Q&A box. Um, so I just want to thank everyone, all of our amazing panelists for joining us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Eric to tell us a quick story that will help set the stage. Okay, thanks, Anne. Um, okay, so the setting of this little story is in Ramsey County, Minnesota, which is where the University of Minnesota's campus where I'm based is a, the setting behind me there is the university. Uh, it's in, in the city of St. Paul, the capital of Minnesota is there. And about two years ago, uh, county commissioners who helped manage the lands of the county decided to sell two parcels of open space uh, without much public discussion at the time. Each of those parcels were near each other in about 80 acres or about 30, just over 30 hectares. One of those parcels happened to be a golf course. Uh, and a lot of our team's work over the past few years has been to try to document and quantify the benefits uh, that golf courses can provide uh, the surrounding communities, particularly in urban areas, kind of the green infrastructure benefits. Um, and the county, before deciding to formally sell that, wanted to have a little public discussion about what those parcels could turn into. And they hired an architecture firm, uh, Perkins & Will, that works internationally, uh, it turns out. Uh, and they actually had heard about our work um, through the U.S. Golf Association's publications about, about the work that we had been doing and actually reached out and wanted to ask us to kind of evaluate the, the benefits kind of the environmental benefits that were being provided by the, the golf course. And we ended up presenting some of our work uh, at some of those community meetings uh, and encouraged uh, the architecture firm to think about all kind of components of sustainability, the economic value, uh, social value and environment when in, in kind of framing that decision. Um, and we tried to actually evaluate scenarios that the architecture firm had developed uh, to, for discussion. And it turned out it was really difficult. They use uh, different software. They don't use GIS, which is what about a lot of our work is based on. Um, and in trying to frame the problem as a multi-objective uh, discussion with the community, uh, that kind of fell flat because each community member had very specific goals. So either they wanted more housing or protection for birds, or they were concerned about flooding. Um, the kind of multiple objectives didn't really, no one resident really was concerned about that. And so that um, the decision has yet to be made and the discussion continues, but I think it reflects both the opportunity, uh, the recognition that the green spaces are providing benefits to the surrounding communities. And so there's kind of uh, common goals around that, but also the challenge uh, and kind of the, the gaps that we need to fill uh, and trying to kind of implement those tools into the active decisions as well as sort of the, just the challenge of multi-objective, multiple objectives. So I hope we get some insight um, around issues like this. this. This issue of the pressure on green space for housing is, is common, at least throughout the United States, and I'm sure elsewhere. And so I hope that, uh, I, I trust that we'll be getting more and more into that as we hear from our panelists. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, so now if I could ask all of our panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, hey, everybody. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do is to start with each of you um, sharing your thoughts on what currently limits the use of nature-based solutions in cities today and whether or not there are knowledge gaps and or particular barriers to implementation that hamper progress in this space. And we thought we'd start on the academic end and move towards the practice end. So I'd like to, to invite Timon to share his thoughts first. Thanks, Anne. It's a pleasure to be here and, and a privilege to be able to speak with everyone. Thanks so much. Um, I wanna pick up on Eric's last point about um, the potential conflicts with pressures on land and the pressure for housing and many kinds of housing in cities as cities are growing, expanding, and even you know, sort of redeveloping in particular areas. 
because we see this, I think, in cities all across the US and you see it similar around the world that as you're developing, there's a need to generate tax revenue, right? There's a need to spur economic development while supplying critical services to urban residents like housing. And so one of the big gaps we still have is to show the full value of what urban nature can provide and does provide. And to me, one of the key gaps here is really understanding this in the context of health and mental health. I think it's been clear during the pandemic, not only for social distancing, but we're, you know, we'll probably see many studies that start to document better the importance of urban nature for stress relief, um, for, you know, just mental, uh, mental recovery during the stress of the pandemic. And yet we don't know very much how valuable that is. I mean, let's put this in context. In the United States, almost 20% of our GDP is spent on healthcare. How much of healthcare costs are avoided by the current green space we already have in cities, by people being able to recreate, by being, people being able to um, increase their physical activity. We've had lots of studies that have shown this, that you know, green, Green spaces in streets, long streets, promote running, promote cycling, right? Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of medical studies showing the mental health benefits also of urban green spaces. And yet, when we're trying to think about the value of uh, new housing development or, or new commercial uh, space development and how that compares with the multiple benefits, climate regulatory and others that we get from urban nature, we just don't know enough about the true value of mental and physical health. And I think this is a massive challenge that we have to overcome if we're going to be able to argue that we need to save space for nature in cities. They're highly dense, right? They're, they're growing rapidly around the world. Uh, and if we're not gonna protect the value um, of nature in cities, we're gonna, we're gonna miss out on some of these fundamental benefits that we have. And I just wanted to pick up on the, the health and mental health piece, because I think it's a huge challenge that we have to address. Thank you so much, Timon. Um, I'd like to gather everybody's opening thoughts and then uh, open up for discussion. So Eric, over to you. Thanks, Anne, and thanks for inviting me to the panel. And similar to Timon, I pick up what, on, on one of the things the previous speaker, Timon, said. So yes, we need to find space for nature in cities, but then we need to remember for this not just to be greenwashing, that nature is nature, it's not just green space, but it is ecosystems with ecological dynamics and it's something different. So we're looking at different types of infrastructure and different types of solutions. And we're quite used to using engineered solutions to deal with anything from climate change adaptation to providing critical services. But if we want to use nature-based solutions, we need to understand that there's a different logic behind them ecology doesn't work like engineering and this we need to realize for really understanding when and how nature-based uh, solutions can contribute because for example if we look to them for helping us deal with climate change we should also be aware that many of the nature-based solutions that we are trying to use are themselves sensitive to climate change so again, if we believe that just by having a green something in our cities, everything should be well, it's not necessarily that simple. It may fail, it may flounder if we're under pressure of climate and especially if we don't know how to manage because quite often nature, green spaces, nature-based solutions in cities are small scale and very much dependent on human management and the management very different from other types of infrastructure. So that said, I would suggest that a challenge with nature-based solutions and possibly a way of moving forward is that I wouldn't say that they are necessarily to be or should be understood as solutions themselves, but they can certainly contribute to solutions and be components of solutions, but if quite often they need to be complemented with other things. Nature is rarely a solution to human problems. It can contribute to solutions, but again, we must be part of uh, creating the actual solution. So just having nature there or just having a green biological component there is not enough. 
Yeah, thanks. It's sort of like a caution not to check a box like, yep, we've got a green space on the land use land cover map and that's going to be good enough. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, Seema, over to you. All right. Um, so when I was thinking about the sort of challenges or knowledge gaps um, that impact how we implement nature-based solutions, there were kind of two things that jumped out at me immediately. First is thinking about how we frame um, uh, the impacts of green investments. And second is about how power is distributed across our implementing institutions. Um, so first, you know, advocates for nature-based solutions and folks in the conservation movement, um, you know, I found kind of overemphasized the benefits of parks and open space and green infrastructure. You know, we, we talk a lot about physical activity, mental health benefits, um, stormwater management, pollution control, um, but often fail to acknowledge the potential harms you know, the inequitable distribution of uh, resources, the possibility of gentrification and displacement, the lack of agency or cultural representation in the built environment. And not to say that we should invest less in green state space. We just need to start from a position where we're, um, you know, really understanding the full scope of consequences, particularly because lower income people and communities of color most often bear the disproportionate burden of the negative impact um, while not, you know, not, and, and the, the balance is different for them um, than a lot of the folks that uh, are leading those, that, that decision-making process. You know, in my experience in the field and in practice, this comes from kind of a, a narrow sense of history. Um, you know, I don't think that we're paying enough attention to the fact that uh, parks and quality of life amenities have historically been developed hand in hand with the systems that have created the inequities in our cities that we're talking so much about today. You know, that we're like, we have that responsibility to take on that legacy. You know, we talk a lot about redlining, but we don't talk a lot about the racialized prioritization of investments in nature to the and the outdoors to you know people with privilege. Um, so you know, going back to Minnesota, um, where I worked for a bit, and um, where Eric's example was, um, you know, I really uh, appreciated the work of Kirsten Delagarde in the Mapping Prejudice Project. Um, you know, she studied the system of parks and lakes that. Um, helped Minneapolis become, you know, the number one park system in the nation for many years. Um, and she found that the residential neighborhoods that were developed in tandem with those natural resources, um, you know, all those neighborhoods were developed with racially restricted covenants. Um, so that meant that black and brown residents were like legally not allowed to live near this incredible investment um, in nature 100 years ago. Um, and so when you look at that as a broad, in the broader context, um, you know, the park system was really being used as a real estate tool. Um, and really it was an effective one. You know, now those are the most affluent um, communities in the city. Um, and, you know, this scheme created a century of generational wealth and stability for white homeowners while black and brown residents were pushed to areas with fewer parks, more inequitable development practices, more heavy industry. And you know, all of those places are now experiencing gentrification. So there's just this cycle um, of disinvestment and um, uh, inequity that's happening there. And so I'll just touch a little bit on the second topic um, about how, you know, how that plays out into how we implement. Um, you know, because we're not thinking about this holistic um, impact of parks on economic development, land use, housing, the cultural infrastructure of the city, then the implementing agencies, the parks department in the local government um, are siloed from those other departments. You know, you can only work within the bounds of the sidewalk, like you can't even touch the street, like that's a different department, that's public works. Um, but we really need to, you know, if we think about this broader analysis of the, pro, the you know, the benefits and the consequences, then you know it'll become clear that parks needs to, and you know, and the climate infrastructure needs to like really be integrately um, tied with other parts of the government that are impacting economic development, housing, land use, and all of those things. Thank you, Seema. So many great themes coming up here. <laughs> I can't wait for the discussion part. But first, I want to hear from. Todd, and then Joe. So over to you, Todd. Thanks, Anne. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to first maybe pick up on a point that Eric Anderson made in his opening remarks. I think he said, you know, ecology doesn't work in the exact same way as engineering. Um, and, and that's such a true point and the crux of one of the biggest challenges for 
urban NBS and green infrastructure. Uh, we're asking traditional engineers and infrastructure developers to think differently, to plan differently, to come up with implementation plans that are quite different than what they're accustomed to. And oh, by the way, you also need to think about different financing approaches for green infrastructure relative to, to the traditional uh, you know, steel and cement approaches. And like anything, change is hard. It takes time. Um, and that is something that we continually need to work with and increase the comfort level of these decision makers of all of the values of green infrastructure within our cities. That idea of time um, has also proven to be one of the challenges, uh, at least from a, a temporal perspective of when we're actually going to recognize the benefits of urban green infrastructure, right? If you build a new stormwater plant, once it's ready and you hit the switch, at least in theory, you can more or less immediately recognize all of the benefits of the filtration and storage and treatment. If you're planting an urban canopy, putting more open space on the landscape, bioswales and the like, it's not immediate. And in some cases, there's years or even a decade between initial implementation and full recognition of benefits. The incentives are not aligned for decision makers and engineers to do things for the benefits to accrue 10 years from now when we think about political realities, election dynamics and the like. So um, that has been, been another challenge. The last thing, and again, this, this builds a little bit on what Seema was saying, and I 100% agree with her remarks around um, you know, equity, justice, community engagement, making sure the appropriate folks, especially underserved community, have a seat at the table. Um, so important, also not easy to do, especially with the current structures that we have. So there's tons of guidebooks and roadmaps produced by NGOs like WRI on what needs to happen, how you do it, but putting it on, in, into practice and asking infrastructure developers to do that in addition to their day job, right? Or at least what they perceive as their day job has not been something that globally or even in big cities in the US we've been successful at to date. So a lot of challenges, but uh, also excited to get to the opportunities part because it's not all bad news. There's a lot of exciting opportunities. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. And last but not least, I'd like to invite Joe to give us his thoughts. Thanks, Anne. Um, I'll probably repeat a lot of what was already <laughs> said a little bit. Um, it's a hard part of going last, but um, I'll point to really three challenges I see them, uh, primarily from a policy and planning perspective in, in a US context, but I think that there are probably some parallels to what we see in, in some other regions globally. Um, First, and I think Seema did a great job describing this, sort of the fragmentation that we see um, in, in how we actually implement um, some of these improvements. Uh, the reality is, and at least in the US, um, you know, we have a, a hyper fracturing of uh, roles and responsibilities in, in terms of our infrastructure ownership and operation, uh, whether that's green infrastructure or gray infrastructure. Uh, we have more than 50,000 water utilities. I often like to say our watersheds do not match our political boundaries. It makes it extremely challenging um, to, to mobilize resources, make plans, uh, devise new programs when there's just a huge fracturing of responsibilities and oversight. So I would point to that as, as sort of a primary challenge here as we think of implementation. Second, um, which, which several um, fellow uh, panelists have, have already touched on, lack of, of real clear, consistent climate measures uh, and information here. If we cannot clearly identify um, what some of the challenges are, um, how can we begin to, um, to address them? Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of great examples out there in very ad hoc ways, um, you know, certainly in the academic literature and elsewhere, um, particularly from a climate science perspective of trying to measure um, what some of these challenges are. But are we translating these, these, these climate measures into economic measures that, that all types of leaders can understand? Because, you know, often, uh, unfortunately, you know, planners and others aren't the ones controlling the purse strings. Um, mayors, governors, others are. Um, can they understand both the costs and the benefits here in an economic sense? Um, often that is not the case. Um, you know, when we talk about cubic feet of water or <laughs> uh, other risk factors, um, that isn't easily interpreted, I don't think, by, by some of our leadership that actually controls some of the funding um, for, for some of these decisions. And then last, but not least, I think is the elephant in the room is lack of proactive uh, investment. And I don't mean just sort of the need for more money here, but channeling money 
into what is ultimately a broken framework um, for, for getting these projects done. Overly reactionary, uh, done in silos. Um, and, and that's true, I, I think, especially in the public sector, you know, as I like to say, state states and local governments are, are responsible for more than three quarters of our public spending on transportation and water infrastructure each year. In the United States, they are bearing a lot of this responsibility. It, it's challenging for them to have the capacity to address some of these newer uh, projects. Procurement is, is a big deal, rethinking procurement. Um, and the private sector too, you know, we, we hear they're sitting on a lot of resources when we think of ESG investing. Where are they going to put all that money? There's a lack of matchmaking, I think, um, to even understanding where those resources could go and, and a danger for greenwashing, um, as others have already pointed to. So a lot of challenges here, but, but very much looking forward to the solutions too. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm going to check the Q&A box here. So um, we thought we'd have a little bit of a, a conversation now about challenges, although I, I feel myself already wanting to move towards solutions. It's not fun to dwell in the challenges for too long. Um, but I, I thought I would see one theme that definitely came up a bunch is this issue of silos being a problem. And that's something that I've seen time and time again with NACAP's work in this space where we're trying to talk about co-benefits. Oh, look, nature-based solutions bring all these things that maybe we've inflated a little bit according to SEMA and not focused enough on the challenges side of things. But I feel that we often hear, we're often talking to people in municipal governments who say, well, yeah, but education benefits of green space are not my thing. Like I, I, my jurisdiction is not to care about that. And I think you've each brought up these challenges of, of silos in planning when we're trying to think about something that's long-term multi-benefit sort of a systems perspective. And I'm just wondering if while I'm trying to focus on the Q&A box here, uh, if any of you would like to talk a little bit more about that challenge of going across silos. Um, I might jump in and maybe steal a remark from my solutions, um, but I guess I wanted to just sort of dig in a little bit more on the, um, the community engagement piece, because I think that it might be a, like in a way, a way through it. Um, you know, it's, I think like I'm coming to this realization after like multiple degrees and like 10 years as a practicing architect and um, you know, like more and more, like I think of myself as an expert, um, but I think that community members are also experts. Like we are never going to understand the nuance of how a, like a change of the built environment is gonna affect like on the ground locally, you know, that mixture of like, oh, well, it created this, like, um, this shift in the real estate dynamic, but it also was a great place where I love to go walk my dog and, you know, like being able to, like, people, people understand the world holistically and it, they aren't siloed. They're not, like, people don't think about just housing. They're not just experts in, um, you know, where they like to go for walks. Like, they, like, they think about those things, like, uh, um, intersectionally. And so I think, if we can bring, think about the people that we're engaging, like first of all, bring them to the table and then second of them, treat them like experts um, and allow the people who are gonna be impacted by um, the investments that we're making to get to decide you know, what that balance is. Um, and also, you know, it brings added benefit that those people will also be the political advocates for creating um, the structures to make those changes. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's less about like, you know, the engineers and the experts over here engaging the community, but it's really thinking about like, we're all experts in something and, and they actually can bring a lot to the table in, in thinking about how all of these things tie together and connect. Yeah, thanks. Can I pick um, up on Seema's point real fast? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, I one just to totally <laughs> agree that the, the local residents in their neighborhoods know best what they need and they're articulating it. You know, the question is like, who's listening? Uh, and I think this whole issue of how do you change the processes of decision-making so, so that they have a seat at the table gets to Joe's point about some fundamental structures that aren't in mm -hmm. place. Um, so Anya's question about the siloization that we have had, especially in 
uh, city government decision making, which you know, is a long-standing tradition of how you sort of set up and, and, and create governance structures, is something that there's also, I think, the emergence of potential uh, shifts that are starting to happen there. And one of them is the increasing recognition of the way in which climate change is impacting cities and the development, it's slow, it's emerging, but the development of these agencies that are cross-agency agencies, right? These offices of sustainability, these offices mm -hmm. of resilience. Uh, and where those exist, there at least is a, a bit of a light maybe at the end of the tunnel of how we can start to harness that as the baby steps towards a more radical shift in governance structures that can break through this siloization and start to harness. Because they're, at least in some specific examples I have in mind, they're charged with working across agencies to try to unite goals around health and goals around transportation and goals around housing through the need to deliver resilient solutions or sustainable solutions. So I think that's an opening. But we also see that they haven't solved the problem of process of engaging with the communities who have their own knowledge about what those solutions are. So it's a starting point. I think it's sort of starting on that solution space. And maybe that's a place that we can sort of break that open even more as we sort of push on the need for new governance structures. Actually, time in, I'll call on you next, Todd, but I'm looking at one of the questions in the Q&A that would be a great follow-up here about whether or not you can, or anyone can, this is from Taylor Ricketts, Give an example or two of a city that has done a great job in busting those silos, accounting for equity, engaging communities well, or otherwise addressing, addressing these challenges. You've just alluded to a few examples that you might have in mind. Maybe you could give one quickly and then we'll turn it over to Todd. Well, I, I'll, I'll give two very fast. I'm not, I don't think they are hitting the mark perfectly on all those categories, right? <laughs> so I think, for example, you know, after Hurricane Sandy in New York City, this establishment of the Office of Resiliency, now the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency, has been fundamental to the city's ability to start to develop solutions that cut across silos. And some of the responses, um, led in part by that agency, but contributed by many agencies uh, to the current Ida, aftermath of the Ida hurricane in New York that quickly within weeks put out a unified response of the city about what, are, what do we have to shift, accelerating plans that were on the books and saying we got to put these in place um, right away, including nature-based solutions. I think the city of Phoenix and establishing a heat resiliency office um, together with Miami are two places that are starting to lead to say, no, we have to think thematically about governance and we have to be thinking about how heat cuts across all aspects of the city in terms of who's most affected and how we develop solutions. That doesn't mean they've solved the equity problems or they've solved the you know, engagement or really dealing with procedural justice problems. But I think there's the beginning of, of starting to, to rethink governance. Those great, are great thanks. examples uh, to me. And um, maybe to kind of go to the other side of the country in, in San Francisco and um, I do want to give them credit for starting the process. Uh, we are not there yet to say that it's been a success, but uh, WRI, along with Encourage Capital, has been partnering with San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, the Ports Authority, and the Department of Transportation, on what we're calling the Joint, Joint Benefits Authority. Um, and the idea is we're, we're piloting it in the Islaus Creek area, for those familiar with, with the Bay Area. Um, deploying green infrastructure in an area that is, um, you know, uh, a poverty stricken area, um, not as much development and as needed there, and thinking about the benefits and values that each agency would get out of a green infrastructure project, right? The, uh, it's you know, on the water, so the ports obviously have a, a major role to play, SFPUC from a flood control perspective. Uh, and then Department of Transportation, when it floods, that screws up roads and, and pathways and the like. Um, can we at least order of magnitude begin to model out using tools like invest, what have you, what the benefits are for each of those agencies, and then they financially contribute in kind. Um, can we create economies of scale on the planning, on the monitoring, on the financing? Each of those departments right now has their own staff of men and women doing those things, and there's a lot of overlap. So we're working towards sort of a joint benefits approach and if successful, this could be over a billion dollar uh, green infrastructure development project. So not a small pilot, but full scale implementation. Other cities like Seattle and Pittsburgh 
are at the table as well, watching and looking how they might contextualize for their needs as well. Happy to share more information after the after the panel. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Eric, I see you've got your hand up. And also, I'd like to direct a question from the Q&A box to you, which is about the sort of otherness of people and nature. And I think this is something that you've thought a lot about. How do we change the paradigm of needing to save nature or the planet rather than recognizing how intertwined our fates are? So maybe you can talk a little bit about that as well as what moved you to raise your hand. Okay, let's see what I can do. I want to pick up on something Todd said, and this is certainly not a solution to how to align very different governance processes and to deal with this siloed approach to monitoring cities. But what we could, like, there's a promise here in nature-based solutions because it provides a common denominator. It is potentially a solution to many different problems. So instead of starting with the nature-based solutions themselves. If we look to what different sectors, different silos need, and if you can show there that, well, this is something that could actually be addressed by this a particular nature-based solution. And then if many of them come to realize that it is the same solution they're actually interested in. So instead of just starting with a solution and try to sell it in, you start with their specific needs, and then you have a very real connector between the silos. Then, of course, the next step is to figure out how to jointly govern or implement that solution. But still, it is a connector here. Before, we have looked to different solutions, which makes it even harder to coordinate. But here, there is a commonality or could be a commonality just because nature-based solutions have multiple different potential benefits. Ooh, to okay. the other question, the otherness of people and nature. Mm, I think I may actually come back to that on the opportunities or more promises of nature-based solutions, because there really is a need to shift how we think about nature and also how we think about nature-based solutions as being something that we're more part of than something that is just there implemented. Uh, so they're recognizing that we are part of the ecology of nature-based solutions could maybe be a bit or a tiny step towards the realization that we're part of any ecology or part of the biosphere at the global level. Great, thanks. I feel like we're all chomping at the bit to get to talking about the solutions piece. So I'm just leave the floor open for a second. If any of you would like to say anything else about a challenge or this, section of our discussion that you would like to get out on the table before we move to talking about slightly more optimistic things. Okay, over to you, Eric, to moderate the next more fun chunk. Yeah, it seems like that was all the questions from the from the audience were all about, okay, that's depressing. Let's hear some, some positive news. <laughs> um, so we're gonna kind of flip the order uh, for talking a little bit about sort of the opportunities and solutions. Uh, Joe, you started, you kind of laid out clear three challenges. And uh, why don't you start with maybe some, some, some of the opportunities or solutions to some of that? Yeah, great, Eric. Uh, look, and, and I'll, I'll kind of parallel sort of laid out those three challenges and a lot of what everyone else has been talking about kind of to three, as I see them, three opportunities um, moving forward. Again, looking not just towards playing lip service, I think, to this, but actual implementation and, and change on the ground in, in different places. Um, you know, first, I, I think it's, it's that we're talking so much about fragmentation and siloing and, and sort of different starting points. Obviously, coordinated planning, <laughs> um, you know, coordinated policies are a no-brainer. Um, and, and I would say that's true not only in terms of the what, you know, of what sort of projects are we doing and how is the money flowing, but who. You know, do we actually have the people in place at a local level in different agencies to do this? Um, do we have the actual talent, the capacity to do this? Um, and so a lot of my work focuses on workforce development across the infrastructure sector, where there's huge challenges right now, uh, even just replacing um, some of the skilled workers who we already have here. And I'm not just talking about those who are wearing hard hats to actually install 
some of these systems, but but actually managers, um, those in finance, human resources, customer service. We are having a huge uh, silver tsunami <laughs> in this sector at the moment and, and a huge challenge in filling the talent pipeline um, to actually ensuring we have the leaders in place to, to pioneer um, some of these solutions, let alone just kind of doing the same old, same old. So if we don't address the human potential here, <laughs> in addition to sort of the physical what, I think it's a huge missed opportunity uh, and something that can connect to communities and, and to the types of, of visible improvements we can see in, in place. You know, and, and this doesn't have to be just an, an overly formal thing. I mean, I think there's places with different starting points here. Um, you know, a lot of people have look at Philadelphia, for example, as you know, their green city clean waters effort. I look to, like to look across the river at Camden, New Jersey, um, which is a place that has tremendous environmental uh, justice issues, uh, economic issues, but they have done some interesting work. Um, I, I've talked to their utility there quite frequently on the Camden Collaborative Initiative, where they brought together, even informally, uh, the utility with Rutgers, with other community organizations to talk, start talking about not just sort of infrastructure, but green infrastructure um, and, and visions moving forward. So to the extent that there's people in place um, talking about these issues in formal ways, but informal ways, I think is, is a step to go. Second, I'll, I'll brief, be brief on these, these next two. Um, second is, is on measurement. Um, and, and I kind of mentioned before sort of the, there, there's data out there, but how do we harness that information? How do we start to apply it? So it starts feeding into how we do these things uh, in, a, in, a, in a repetitive way that just becomes obvious, this is how we should do them. Um, and right now we just haven't done that. Um, so looking at um, how places can incorporate these measures into their capital planning process, not just sort of in long range, comprehensive plans, but capital planning. How are they embedding these measures into how they judge the benefits and costs of different projects, I think is important. Um, I highly recommend for those who haven't seen, uh, Jan Whittington at the University of Washington has led some tremendous work on climate smart capital improvement planning. Um, and and I, I think it's really foundational work for, for thinking about this. Um, third, I, I think, you know, being in Washington, I can't not, not say this. Um, there's a federal moment <laughs> right now, um, kind of impossible to ignore, uh, that I think has, has certainly ramifications for the U.S., but, but even um, globally. Um, you know, how, how are places going to maximize this moment? Um, and I think there's a real danger of just throwing more money at some of these things and, and you know, kind of the sugar rush that some places have of just doing projects and, and doing construction and doing the same old, same old. But but how are we actually going to look at this, hopefully the spike in spending in a way that's actually going to lead to some, some renewed um, approaches, uh, ways to address some of our legacy systems that, that Sima was, was talking about. So, um, you know, it's going to require different federal agencies to be involved, uh, SEC, Treasury, for example, in, in addition to EPA and DOT, um, and in addition to other, other public and private leaders across the country. But, but I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, okay, continuing in reverse order, uh, Todd, you're up. Thanks, Eric. And, and Joe, just for clarification, living in Southwest Colorado, sometimes it's quite healthy to just pretend Washington DC doesn't exist. Um, so, but uh, no, in, in all seriousness, so, so three things that give me a lot of hope. Uh, you mentioned some of the capacity, both gaps and opportunities there. Um, and that is a, a, a real thing we need to be looking at and job trainings and the like. Um, I no longer believe that the availability of money is a limiting factor. Um, if you look at green bonds that have been focused on urban NBS, both in the US and Europe and increasingly in Latin America, they are all oversubscribed, right? Investors are falling, falling over themselves to buy them at a premium. Um, and so it, you, I think it was you actually, uh, uh, Joe, who mentioned before, you know, creating that pipeline of bankable deals, thinking about the combination of green infrastructure along with gray infrastructure to get bigger, bigger deal sizes is going to drive more implementation um, examples, et, et cetera. So money is no longer the limiting factor. We've just got to put good projects forward to attract that investment that is sitting on the sidelines. Um, unlike 10 years ago, we now have a plethora of successful cases to point to. And like most things in life, success breeds success. This is no longer, will it work? It's, it has worked. And here's how you do it. Here's the mistakes that we made, make different ones. 
next time. And so I feel pretty good that we can go to utility directors, infrastructure developers, what have you, and point to different places from large cities to like New York City down to Little Rock, Arkansas, right? Uh, a couple hundred thousand folks and say, it's not just the big guys that can do this. This can be deployed anywhere and everywhere from prosperous areas to, to areas of, of, of low income. And the third, and again, this builds on what you said, Joe, is the monitoring side. Um, one of the big challenges over the last decade plus has been, yeah, but does this really work, right? Does it attenuate floods? You know, does it provide the, the nitrogen uh, reduction? And with the increase in technology from satellite imagery and triangulating that with kind of on the ground gauge measurement and even the increase in community science, right, is another way to get the communities that is most impacted involved we are getting better at saying it worked, it didn't work, or at least we know the answer and can adaptively manage and enhance our models moving forward. So what were three critical data points, lack of money, right? Lack of, of examples of success and lack of examples of, do we have the data to prove that it worked? We're beginning to overcome all those things. That gives me great hope for the scaling and replication in the, in the years ahead. Thanks. Great job, that was does make me feel good too, being in this field. So that's great. Um, Seema, your turn. And then uh, Eric and Timon to add. All right, um, I'll also give three examples <laughs> um, of, you know, sort of different ways that, um, you know, communities are and, and local governments are addressing the sort of the risk of um, green infrastructure driven gentrification. Um, and they're kind of, you know, top down, middle out, bottom up, um, example. So the first, um, and I'll just add the caveat that, you know, I, uh, I used to work at Trust Public Land and was on a team that was supporting um, different groups in cities around the country. And I haven't been in that role for over a year, or almost a year. So I might be a little out of date in my kind of intimate knowledge of, of what's going on with these projects. But um, so I'll speak a little bit um, of, of, of what I knew then. And hopefully, um, you know, we can, we can all catch up um, and, and research what's going on, um, you know, with the pandemic and everything, how these projects are going. Um, but the, the first one I'm thinking of um, is India Basin Shoreline Park in San Francisco. Um, and this is a project in Baby Hunters Point. It's one of, um, it's a historically black community in San Francisco, one of the kind of few affordable places um, left in the city. And there is a proposal to kind of completely re revitalize um, the shoreline there. Um, and really it was the leadership um, at the local level, Bill Ginsburg, the um, director of the parks department basically, you know, said like, we can't, this can't just be a traditional um, parks project. We need to be thinking about the broader equitable development of this community because this project does have the potential of completely changing the neighborhood. And so, you know, I think the city along with um, kind of nonprofit partners has um, developed this system where like they have engaged um, a Philip Randolph um, Institute, which is a local on the ground um, racial justice group um, and like given them a big grant so that they can show up at the table um, and really guide, you know, it's not just community engagement led by the city, but community engagement actually led by the community supported by the city. Um, and so they have been working on this equitable development plan um, that's addressing housing and jobs and um, economic development and, and transportation and really looking at how this park is going to change um, all aspects of the community. Um, and it really came from the leadership um, at the local government level to say, okay, we know we need to do this. And how are we going to change the process um, to make sure that happens? Um, the second project is the 11th Street Bridge Park um, in Washington, D.C., which, um, you know, with the help of a like really tenacious um, nonprofit group um, working for many years, but um, uh, have both raised, you know, $60 million for um, the physical infrastructure of this park that's going to cross um, the river, um, connecting a more affluent part of DC to the Anacostia neighbor, neighborhood, um, which uh, is also a historically black neighborhood, um, lower income neighborhood in the city. Um, and they've also raised $60 million of community development funds. 
So they're working on job training programs, developing a community land trust before, to preserve housing affordability, increasing food access, education resources, small business um, investments. And, and really that was led, you know, I think of it more through the like nonprofit sector, um, raising a lot of money, both from public sources, but a lot of private philanthropy um, to make sure, and it, they've been doing all of these community development investments before, like they haven't even broken ground yet um, on the park itself, but there's been, you know, five, seven years of um, organizing and um, defense developing these um, programs to make sure that, you know, as more investment comes to the neighborhood, it's, you know, a healthy, sustainable community um, that can thrive with the, with that new investment as opposed to being um, kind of steamrolled by them and, and pushed out. And then the last one, which was more bottom up um, that I'll mention is the LA River um, Open Space and Housing um, Collaborative, La Rosa. Um, which is a collective of really grassroots environmental justice groups and housing justice groups that have come together um, to, to realize that this conflict between like land for housing and land for parks um, is pitting these two it, like essential needs against each other. And they've come together to say, okay, how do we advocate for th these things together? If we're gonna be building a bunch of new housing in LA, you know, that housing needs to be affordable. It also needs to be close amenities that people need to live healthy, um, you know, happy lives. And so they are collectively, you know, targeting, um, you know, all of the like state funding opportunities, um, legislative actions, um, on the ground organizing, and really just trying to find ways to constantly be advocating for parks and housing together. Um, and, you know, are starting to make inroads in sort of like from a legislative and a funding perspective, like how do we create um, funding models that support the joint development of those things? And then on the ground, advocating um, for those projects as they come up throughout the city. Um, so th those are all, you know, extremely like places where I am really looking forward to seeing how those things develop and grow. And hopefully they can be case studies that uh, aren't just one off then um, we can learn from. Great. That was awesome. Thanks, Seba. Um, Eric, you're up and I know you have to leave uh, soon. Looks like you might be in a some sort of station of some kind uh -huh. or large hangar. Um, but uh, for those that if you have questions specifically for Eric, please put them in the chat now because he has to leave soon. So go ahead, Eric. Thanks. Thanks. And so I thought I'd talk a bit about not so much the strategic level of planning but practice instead and i find it interesting that some of the things that we've talked about as challenges can also be if not solutions but at least a promise for moving forward so fragmentations sectorization and so forth it is a problem but you can also look at it as a type of diversification because working through nature-based solutions is a way of creating opportunities for more people to be involved and empower people to make a difference themselves. Engineered technical solutions tend to be, they, well, they require a lot of expertise. They require specific skills. Well, yes, so do nature-based solutions, but they are more open to uh, well, us all to be involved in hence many of the solutions will be collective solutions and they of course is not necessarily so that they would naturally address all the problems of uh, inequitable access to means funding processes of decision making and so forth but just by being more open to people getting involved i think there's a great promise here uh, nature and nature-based solutions and this goes back to the question I posed before like if we see ourselves as part of the solution not just a solution as something we put there and then leave it there but uh, nature-based solutions they will need continued they aren't just plant and installed but they need continued maintenance management and so forth and this is something that will could involved for many of us and to discuss on what terms and in what ways we can be involved there's an opportunity there to build something that is grounded in 
multiple interests, multiple different needs, multiple different understandings of what native-based solutions are and in what ways they could contribute to our quality of life and our neighborhoods. So I think there's a promise there. Of course, diversity is hard to harness, but still diversity is also, or it does provide opportunities for people to be part of the solutions. Great, thank you. Uh, and then hopefully we can get some questions in before you have to go. Uh, Timon, to close it out. Thanks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick back up on my earlier point about health, which we haven't talked a lot about and I want to. Um, <laughs> and, but I'll start with you know, where we see some opportunity space. I think one of the things that hundreds, if not thousands of medical studies that have shown the importance of nature on uh, mental and physical health have been picked up by some sectors, right? So if you look at uh, both retrofits and new hospital development, the mounting of evidence around how fast post-operation recovery happens, it's improved when you're in a courtyard that has green space, the way in which our mental health affects our physical health and therefore being able to see plants outside your window or even have plants inside your recovery room has changing the way that hospitals are both building new hospitals and the way in which they're retrofitting. So everyone wants to have a post-op recovery room that's a little courtyard or access to a courtyard or views out the window because you can measure the benefits both from a health perspective and the economic benefits of less time spent in the hospital that mounts up X number of bills. So I think there's some real opportunity to think about how we can apply what that sector has learned in our schools, into our residential buildings, into our commercial spaces, and really start to amplify that because it's incredible to me how fast this has taken off. The monetary benefits that go along with the health benefits have been able to mobilize new finance and new prioritization of nature in those kinds of spaces. How do we do that in a lot of others? And I think this is one of the keys to unlocking potentially massive amounts of finance, not only in US contexts, as we're a little focused on here today, it seems like, but in many other contexts all around the world. And just to anchor that point, if you think about that cost in the United States context for healthcare, upwards of three and a half trillion dollars being spent on healthcare every year, what fraction of that could be put instead into investing in nature-based solutions in the city, all across all aspects of the city, that could lower our healthcare costs. And if we did that, and what would that be? Maybe that's a trillion a year that we need to really come to the scale of the, of the challenge that we're facing and investing in a way that can be more inclusive because the piecemeal approach is, is gonna keep having equity uh, problems in terms of how it's prioritized. We need an order of magnitude shift in the investment in nature-based solutions. And there are ways that we should be able to mobilize that finance, especially if we can better demonstrate the diverse values and, and, and to my mind, the gap in the mental and physical health value, which perhaps might be the largest monetary value of, of any of the many benefits that they have. I wanna jump to a quick point if I can, because I think it picks up on this that Oliver raised in the chat uh, and feel free to cut me off, Eric, if you, if you want to, but there's this question uh, that Oliver had about how do you not displace people when you're investing. And I think Seema pointed to some really great examples of the way in which you can couple housing and other priorities with nature-based solutions. I think this is one of the key issues that we have to do a better job of. And it goes to this question of siloization as well. Um, and so maybe we can talk a little bit uh, more about, you know, how do you get this done without driving, you know, increasing gentrification or driving other forms of displacement? And one would be that we scale up the investment so massively that everyone can benefit. Uh, I, I think the other is really, you know, the governance side and the implementation side is coupling. And that's a challenge for us, right? That is about not, like we, we have this challenge where we've been spending decades arguing that nature-based solutions matter, that we want to invest in green infrastructure. And now we realize that we can't do it by themselves. You can't just put it in by itself. It has to be coupled with energy security and food security and housing security, and those together have to be solved. Uh, and I think that perhaps is maybe our bigger challenge. How does this get out of the realm of 
ecologists advocating for urban nature um, or, uh, or, or us advocating from a health perspective. Um, so I'm gonna throw that out as, as, as a challenge to consider a little bit more, but also because I think, you know, one of Seema's examples is sort of a perfect example of what's already happening and how we're starting to solve that by, by coupling these together and really bring the community voices in that says, no, we need the housing and we need the, the mobility and we need the green space. All right, thanks, Tymon. Um, just in case Eric is still on, it looks like he may have actually left, but I, I wanted to pick up off of the sort of the community engagement uh, question. This is something that's come up in the story that I brought up at the beginning and in a couple of questions on the, the panel, just sort of when um, there is engagement and just sort of combating sort of the, the last loudest voice sort of dominating, um, it may be a special interest or things and just sort of what um, kind of these broader community engaged visions that you just laid out time in and SEMA um, and maybe the work of the, the seeds of the Anthropocene. I don't know if time and you've been involved in that at all uh, as a, maybe a, a process for sort of that. I wonder if you could, could speak to a little about some of the kind of mechanisms that might be used when this kind of a whole bunch of money and opportunity is coming. How do we then kind of prevent these sort of special interest from, from preventing progress using these engagement tools. So if the groups want to talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, I'd be happy to jump in. I mean, I think it's sort of unfortunate we use the word community engagement for like such a broad like spectrum of act activities. You know, there is like what I kind of think is like the typical community engagement is where you like set out um, like a notice on the city website, you hold a meeting at 2 p.m. at City Hall and, you know, you get a bunch of like, you know, old predominantly white um, retirees who show up because they are the ones that have the time and the interest to show up. Um, and, you know, that like those are the places where you get those like loud voices um, or the sort of more unofficial um, in, in community engagement where, you know, you open yourself up to like developers and, you know, hearing from the people who make who, want, who figure out how to make sure that they get heard um, because they have a financial interest. And, you know, so like that is considered, you know, community engagement in some ways. But then also like, you know, there's really like a whole world of community engagement processes where you're really going out to the community proactively um, and like going to events that are already happening, asking everyday people, um, you know, how they want to, like what they want to see in their future, how they want to prioritize things in their built environment. And it's really requires, it, it does take a lot of time and a lot of energy, a lot of cultural awareness. Um, and, but going out and asking people and giving them the opportunity to not just say, okay, here's a really narrow set of questions. Can you please fill, fill out my survey, but to actually like engage them as people and, um, and then also do the work of, um, you know, making sure that people like see the feedback loop of what you've what you've heard from them and making sure that people get to see what other people said um, to say, okay, hey, loud community voice that wants X, you know, we talked to 50 other people who want who want Y and help the community understand, you know, how they are collectively prioritizing things um, and, you know, kind of think about how that conversation gets shaped and and making sure that you reach out to the people who are the most vulnerable, the most um, have the most potential for being impacted. And then also, you know, through that process and, you know, at Able City where I'm working now, um, like we have this whole process that we call like the city makery um, uh, community engagement process where we're thinking about how are we engaging citizens, not just about the particular project that we're talking about, but how are we giving them the tools and the knowledge to be more engaged in the future? Um, and so like teaching them, teaching community members, like how to have impact in their local government, in addition to just getting feedback on, you know, the thing that we're looking at. And so I think it's like these processes build on top of each other. And once you have good community engagement and people know that you're listening and that what they say actually makes it in, you know, whether it's not like, doesn't necessarily have to make it into the final design, but it has to be make it far enough that it was considered respectfully. Um, and then you'll get more voices um, and hopefully be able to, to get, um, 
you know, that more kind of comprehensive look of, of what the priority should be. If I could just really jump in really quickly, I think Seema raises an important point of, as we think of engagement, not only in the planning process, but in the actual, you know, how we manage <laughs> these assets over time. And, and, and where I've seen going back to the, some of the workforce issues I was describing before, um, communities that have done really well is providing visibility and awareness of what these, these projects even are. I think there's not a universal understanding <laughs> when, when a rain garden is installed, for example, of, of what is this? You know, it's not just different landscaping, but it's actually an asset for the community. And it, it provides visibility for even students and, and younger prospective workers in this space to understand what is what is a green career? You know, I, I mean, a lot of our water infrastructure is buried and invisible to a lot of people. They think it's a dirty job. Why, why would it be a career of choice? And yet, yet when they see a, a demonstration project or, or the value that these systems provide for their community, it's a key inroad to, to many individuals. And, and I mean, I'm going down to grade school level <laughs> um, of, of kids just understanding what what is the meaning of this for, for our community, for our climate? I wanna be involved in this. Um, it becomes a real path of choice. And so, you know, Louisville, Kentucky is a great example. Um, they hold an annual event called Can You Dig It? Which I just love the title of that. Uh, <laughs> but they bring together um, high school students and younger students, primarily from uh, disadvantaged communities throughout Louisville um, to understand what are careers in this space, actually talking with contractors and firms that are working on these projects. So there's there's a real synergy of not just, well, we're doing these projects and we need public input, but we actually want you to be involved <laughs> from the get-go of what projects we even think about doing in the future and that you have a place here um, because these projects have a place in the community too. All right, great. I think we're gonna shift now um, to kind of the more open and kind of just general questions. So I'm gonna start with uh, one from, from Taylor. Uh, he's been asking for um, basically the kinds of policy and community initiatives uh, that could be used to like what kind of information from the scientific community would be helpful uh, in pushing some of those policies forward. Like we heard some some examples from time and uh, Joe, what, what kind of information do you think could be helpful in kind of informing some of the, the policies and solutions that, that, that you kind of mentioned earlier? It just generally, Eric, in terms of, of federal policies or? Yeah, just sort of like how, how to kind of translate the research uh, and findings uh, and, and kind of turning that into some sort of incentive or even a you know community engagement uh, opportunity kind of from both ends. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say federal, starting at the federal level and kind of working down. Um, I mean, we need more experimentation, clearly. I mean, that there needs to be more, not just sort of one-off you know, pilots, and it's great to, you know, I, I, I could point to, to San Francisco and the Bay Area for so many things, but if you go to middle America and say San Francisco is doing this, it's like, all right, <laughs> like, how do we do this, right? And so replication and, and the willingness, I think, um, not just of planners, but of political leaders to, you know, put their necks out there and do this as, as a priority, that has got to happen in more places. And to the extent that, that our um, policy frameworks at a federal level can build that capacity and that flexibility um, for state and local experimentation where a lot of this is happening. Um, you know, something I've heard a lot is pre-development assistance, right? Is there a way as part of existing federal grants or loans um, via EPA, FEMA, et cetera, um, is there a carve out, right, for, for thinking of not just doing green infrastructure projects, but actually the planning involved of getting community members together, doing better measurement, um, thinking of new financial approaches, like that takes time. And, and, you know, that has got to be part of the experimentation here. So um, we need to think of experimentation in addition to modernization too, of we have a lot of stuff already built out. I mean, in the US, I know that's true in a lot of other <laughs> countries too. Um, and so it's not just building a bunch of new stuff as much as, you know, that's, I think where the political appetite still is of the ribbon cuttings and, you know, um, all that, but I mean, you know, we don't have ribbon cuttings when we repair a pipe or, <laughs> or, or repair some of our existing assets, which is where, I mean, we're in an era of repair and replacement for the most part um, for our spending. And, and so to the extent that it's new experimentation, but also experimentation on existing assets, I, I think ideally um, with some of that pre-development support would be helpful um, in terms of our policies. 
I wonder if I could just jump in and make a yeah, plug please. for a federal program. Um, it is more traditionally oriented to sort of the working rural landscape, um, but NRCS has the Conservation Innovation Grant Program uh, once a year, and it's, I'm not sure what the number is, but you know, about 15, 20 million dollars, average grants are about 500,000. That does exactly what Joe was describing, right? It's that, that sort of pre-feasibility um, stage to engage the relevant stakeholders, to kind of figure out what your project looks like and to set the stage for implementation and financing. So NRCS CIG, thanks. If I could follow up with one from the Q&A box that is linked, which is, are there financing mechanisms that have not been fully explored or taken advantage of that can help fund nature-based solutions in cities? So that was one, Todd, and you talked about um, green bonds. Are there other things that we can point towards here? Sure. Well, and um, so I spend a lot of time in the space of innovative finance, and it's my least favorite word, sort of the innovate, like we all want something new and different. And like what investors want is vanilla, right? What has worked and how do we maybe do a little bit of a tweak to make it relevant for nature-based solutions? So um, look, I'm all about trying new things, but I think that there is still um, a long way to go to fully uh, utilizing traditional debt instruments to fund our urban infrastructure, right? This, we need to get uh, infrastructure developers, investors, project partners very comfortable with utilizing debt and what that means and what credit worthiness is. Um, we don't necessarily need new things. Now, when it comes to eventually paying back investors, right? Just like a mortgage, you get the money up front, you can do the implementation and you pay the bank back over time. It's the same thing for, for infrastructure. What we need to understand is um, you know, how you monetize and where the cash flows come from when you're putting in rain gardens, when cre you're creating additional open space, right? It's very clear, the data, the health benefits of access to nature. How do you turn that into a revenue stream to pay back investors? And that, that's difficult and complicated. And, uh, but what you see time and again, um, Stephen mentioned her work with, I believe she's at Trust for Public Lands. Um, you know, they've done a ton of research on what bond measures and ballot measures pass. Open space and water pass 80 plus percent of the time. So we just need to get more ambitious and get over this, this false belief that most communities won't tax themselves, right, for good stuff. When the data shows that they will, if we can clearly communicate what it is what the benefits are um, and, and, um, and what they're gonna get for it. And that's blue and red districts. Um, so it's not just sort of a liberal big city thing. It can be rural America as well. Thanks. Yeah, actually a question that came in um, uh, from, from Mary, um, wondering about the opportunity, sort of picking up on your points, Todd, about kind of uh, piggybacking off of those sort of popular programs uh, and kind of, you know, we've heard a little bit about um, the kind of benefits of green space, particularly during COVID, uh, kind of leveraging this sort of goodwill uh, on some of the kind of known um, benefits of green infrastructure to kind of, you know, uh, support some of the, the less well-known, like more experimental, um, you know, services that we're, we're kind of unsure about, the sort of idea that we could kind of do the experimentation sort of with something that's more bankable, like the water resources, for example. I mean, are there opportunities that we could kind of explore stack benefits that way as a way to kind of get a foot in the door, so to speak? Yeah, that makes sense to anyone. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in unless one of my colleagues wants to, uh, you know, I think that Again, it's the point of which of these benefits is sort of the anchor benefit that realistically can drive a repayment reality. And oftentimes that is water, right? So stormwater risk reduction, water quality enhancements that can somehow be tied to water bills can be built into the rate structure um, and do it in a way that noise and air pollution can also be addressed. Access to nature and equity issues can be addressed. Those may not be things that we can monetize, even if we can value, 
but they can be covered if we come up with a strategic way to build nature-based solutions into our, our water approach. Just the one last thing I'll say is very rarely are we seeing large scale examples just on the nature side where we're seeing a lot of success are these hybrid approaches, right? Where you're already making an investment in a new tunnel, uh, new gutter systems, what have you for the city. Let's add on the nature-based part. It reduces risk for investors. It increases the overall size. And there's a lot of economies of scale of that approach. Thanks. Here's one from uh, an attendee in the Q&A and I'll direct it to you, Timon. Adverse heat effects on health have been more prominently featured in the media. Would you recommend piggybacking on a currently popular or health related issue like this or COVID like your recent paper as a strategy for community organizers to increase green spaces in urban environments? Absolutely. I, I think I think we have to use every tool in our toolbox, uh, and the you know the disproportionate impacts of air pollution, flooding, heat waves on communities of color and low-income communities and indigenous communities is stark. The media has finally started to wake you know wake up to this, even though it's been well documented um, over and over and over. And so this is a window of opportunity. We need to walk through that door and make the case that one of the solutions to that is a nature-based solution because it's multifunctional, because it can provide multiple benefits simultaneously. But to, I think, some of the other points that have been made here, it needs to be coupled with other structural changes that are driving those kinds of legacies of displacement and disinvestment that have been happening for decades and decades and decades. Uh, and so I think this gets back to Todd's point too, it's probably going to be more successful if we can couple it with, you know, the need to also address housing issues and the need to also address food insecurities in those places and where they are. And, and we're not going to be able to do everything at once, but if we can find the right couplings, they're going to work in that particular case. But I definitely think there's the need to take advantage of the opportunity when the media is, is having a voice loud enough that our decision makers are hearing it and we can use that to open the conversation for perhaps rethinking it. And, and in the US context, I think that there's something really important happening right now with the infrastructure bill. We have a rethinking of what infrastructure is. We haven't fully cracked open that narrative like it should be that urban nature is critical infrastructure because it provides critical services. Housing provides critical services. Transportation provides critical services. Nature provides critical services. And so we have an infrastructure bill, we have a social infrastructure bill, we need an ecological infrastructure bill too. And it needs to be at that scale. It needs to be another trillion dollar bill. So we can use, going back to this question, these issues about uh, disproportionate heat impacts or other kinds of climate impacts, I think is a way to really make that point and argue it more strongly. And I don't know if we'll get all of the change that we want out of the, the next, two weeks of what hopefully will be, you know, getting passed in the house here. But I certainly think there's still some work to do on the narrative side to pick up on narratives that are having agency now and to use those to shift the way in which we think about urban nature as not this other thing, or it'd be nice to have, but no, it's critical. It provides fundamental services for urban livelihoods. Thanks, Timon. Anybody else want to chime in on that theme before we pick a new question? I'll just pick really quickly up time and on the, the federal bill thing, because I feel like I <laughs> am close to that, unfortunately, at the moment. And, um, you know, what I think people don't understand is the politics are the politics they are happening right now, where the real potential is, is in terms of implementation. So if, if you know, knock on wood, um, <laughs> the, the, the bipartisan bill plus the, the reconciliation package cross sort of the political finish line, if you will, in Washington, that's really just the start <laughs> to what's going to be a multi-year, um, really important process <laughs> from the federal level, but a, crucially down to a local level of how are we going to arm ourselves? We had this money, right? We've been kind of calling for for years. How are we going to use that money and harness it in ways that's going to require, like, address some of these issues, including um, heat island effects, et cetera? Um, and so I would just say, like don't like limit ourselves to like whatever is like 
like in the legislation right now and what's like reported in the headlines, but think this is just the beginning <laughs> to like when the headlines die down and like the boring stuff kind of comes to like, no one like is really reporting on it, but it's like, that's the really important stuff of like, how are planners going to do this, right? How are governors and mayors going to get on the table with all this stuff? Um, so it's, it's really just the beginning, which is why I think this is the time where we really have to, conversations like these are so helpful because that's what's going to provide the momentum and the knowledge that's so needed to rethink um, some of the ways in which these monies have flowed in the past and, and have been targeted. Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to move us from the US discussion right now because I think we really are having a moment <laughs> about infrastructure in the US right now. And I feel like there's so much we could talk about in this country in particular, and we've lost Eric at the moment. But I would like to ask particularly Timon and Todd to talk a little bit about your experiences collaborating with others in other parts of the world, maybe um, reflecting on the moment in the US, how, what are some ways in which we can learn from the experiences of countries that are so far ahead of us in terms of thinking about these questions? Happy to jump in first. Um, and I, I did see in one of the questions, there was a specific question about Indonesia. Um, and Coincidentally, last night, uh, way too late US time, uh, I was on a panel with um, government officials from Jakarta um, who have recently implemented two policies. One is to increase the urban tree canopy, um, and the other is to ensure that by, I think it's 2030, every neighborhood in Jakarta has green space. Um, now, as Joe just mentioned, what implementation looks like, we'll, we'll see. But there is a lot of recognition and enthusiasm, especially in the major cities globally, that this is important and something they should be doing. They're looking to the US for examples, but we also need to have some humility in the US and say, as you were saying, Anne, what can we learn from, from what they're doing? Um, the World Bank, I think, is, is um, they get a lot of criticism. Some of it you know, rightly deserves, some of it a little bit unfair. Since 2018, they have increased their investment in green gray infrastructure by $2 billion, not just in the cities, but in rural areas as well. And I raise that one both as a, as a, as a kind of proof point that this is starting to happen at a meaningful scale, but also because of the World Bank's mandate, they are equally focused, not just on the ecological side, but on the poverty alleviation and human uplift side. And I'm not gonna pretend it's 50-50, but it's much more evenly weighted than in the US where, as we've all sort of said in various forms and fashions, that equity piece, the poverty piece, it traditionally has been an add-on to the project, right? The last 10%, and we've got to figure out how to make that right alongside uh, the, the ecological components as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up, maybe just give a couple examples though. Um, I, there, there are other, forms of global finance that are being mobilized. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, whether there's any new surprises or commitments that come out of COP26, which is the major climate um, conference coming up um, very shortly in, in Glasgow, in terms of focus on natural climate solutions, as they're sometimes now called, another word for nature-based solutions with a climate focus. Uh, but we're seeing things like the mobilization of funds for, uh, for example, through the Green Climate Fund or other, other major funds around the world where climate mitigation sources are going into natural climate solutions. Now, how much of that's really coming into urban areas? Not so much as far as you can tell. And that makes sense if your goal is really about absorbing carbon. Um, but I think there's the opportunity, but, but slow shift, uh, a need for a larger shift to really position climate adaptation as a way of mobilizing funds for investing in urban NBS because of the impact that they have directly on people's lives in the places where infrastructure economies and, and people are most concentrated. Uh, and so the most impact, I think, from those kinds of funds will be there. there and you mentioned countries that are far ahead of us. Um, if we look at it from a spending perspective, I mean, the European Commission is spending hundreds of billions on NBS implementation. I haven't added this up, 
Um, I'm kind of curious if you go city by city all across the United States, what that adds up to because they're city level as opposed to you know a large federal structure that's putting that level of investment in. But and I also don't know what the city by city is all across the EU in terms of that funding. But it seems to be a major difference in terms of the amount of commitment to working on uh, working working with nature-based solutions as a source of solutions to multiple um, challenges in urban areas. And so I think there's a lot to learn there. And because it's to some extent not only more invested in, but a longer history of work of implementation of testing experimentation. There's some learning there, and I believe they're starting to work on these process issues of how do people have a voice in the process? You know, what what does equity really look like? Uh, and and also understanding that the there is no one size fits all for any particular nature based solution. That we really have to understand the local context, and that's harder. That's more expensive. That's more time consuming. Uh, and therefore, you're going to have to have more political will and more uh, resources put behind that. And we're starting to see that mobilized as well, especially in the European context of the, the European Commission. But I, I, I'm glad that, Todd, you, you happened to be on this call in Jakarta um, last night, because there's so much that we can learn from other parts of the world who are doing their own experimentation. And, you know, it's not that there's going to be a general answer for everyone, but we all have to be learning from each other because these contexts are unique and also not. Right. There's a there's a lot of aspects that are not unique, but the experimentation and the learning from uh, implementation in Latin America, whether it's Medellin or other places, some of that's going to be useful in our U.S. context. And the same thing, I think, from uh, the massive investments being made across China and other parts of Asia, they're going to mess some things up and they're going to get some things right. And we need to be learning from that as well. All right, I'll, uh, we have one last question. I think I'll, I'll pose it uh, first for Seema. Like as we kind of move forward, I think it's a kind of bringing it back to the uh, structural inequities and making sure we, you know, as all this effort comes in, we kind of avoid that. I guess Seema, you brought this up. What are some, um, how do we kind of make sure that we don't lead to, you know, increasing green gentrification? What are some tools that you use? Kind of how do we make sure that um, as these new, you know, this opportunities of green infrastructure go, that um, it's equitably done. Um, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, there. The gentrification question is interesting because there are like a ton of policy solutions, um, policy levers to address gentrification. Um, it just, you know, a lot of them are. Uh, it's just about building the political will. And it's about sort of like really questioning like how real estate is developed, how, um, you know, how we think about how we're investing in certain places. You know, so I, I mean, I have, a, <laughs> I have a list of them, you know, like you can think about like what is the relationship between green, in, like green investment um, and like think about like, well, what, what happens in those surrounding neighborhoods? Like what's happening um, in terms of home ownership? What's happening in terms of property taxes? Um, are you know who's who's getting to take advantage and benefit from the increase in property values? Are rents going up too quickly? You know what are the things that you can do to make sure that the people who have lived in those communities get to actually benefit from the, those investments? So whether it's through property tax relief or you know taxing developers for flipping homes in neighboring communities. Um, or thinking about like what is the like the makeup of jobs in that neighborhood? Can you pair um, investments in the the built environment with investments in job training and education and childcare? You know, like all of these things. Like it's it's not about limiting the investment that happens um, in a particular place, but it's just making sure that the investment isn't happening just on the land, but it's happening. With the people that are that are surrounding um, that physical place, um, and making sure that like we think of that community, you know, a, a park, a neighborhood park, as like part of the community, and an investment in the park needs to be paired with an investment in the community, um, so that the future is a more healthy and sustainable community from an economic perspective, from a cultural perspective from a mental health perspective, from a physical health perspective, um, holistically. And there are like a ton of, like, 
there's a lot of policy handbooks and guidebooks out there of, you know, there's like probably a hundred ways, policy solutions out there that different, um, that could sort of counteract the, the pressure of gentrification and displacement. Um, and, you know, they're being tried in bits and pieces here and there. And I mean, I think there's a long way to go in terms of building the political will to challenge our sort of like traditional, um, you know, real estate is such an important like part of American capitalism and um, how wealth is derived in this country. So it's, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's, it's just a matter of, of prioritization. Well, I'm afraid that it's 9.30 <laughs> Pacific time. And as much as I would honestly love to keep having this conversation all day, we're gonna have to wrap here. Um, but this has been so much fun. I really wanna thank each of our panelists for your wisdom and sharing your thoughts and experiences. And I would love to find ways to keep this conversation going. We started with challenges and focused on solutions towards the end here. And I feel like this is really a key moment for this country, for this planet. And I feel better knowing that you all are out there working on it, those of you in the audience, as well as those on the panel. So um, round of applause for everybody and let's just keep working on this stuff. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in various ways in this space. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Is there a way to save?